Following the oil crisis of 1979-80, the American auto producers suffered record losses as customers moved away from gas guzzlers toward more fuel-efficient cars. With declining market share, the U.S. automakers asked Congress to restrain imports in some way. President Ronald Reagan asked the Japanese automakers to limit exports of passenger cars to the United States. This voluntary export restraint program allowed 1.7 million Japanese cars into the U.S. each year. The cap was raised thereafter before the program was terminated by 1994. The effect on the sale of Japanese cars of the VER program was that it raised the price of Japanese cars by about $1,200 while reducing the quantity of Japanese cars sold. The net effect on Japanese earnings, however, was close to zero. In other words, the revenues earned were the same at the higher price as at the lower price. The effect on the sale of U.S. cars is that the U.S. managed to increase the quantity of cars sold at this higher price and U.S. car sales and profits increased. The cost of this program was clearly to American consumers who paid the higher price for a smaller quantity of cars and certainly a smaller quantity of Japanese cars with a larger quantity of American cars. The cost to American consumers was recorded at around $13 billion measured in 1983 dollars. The overall net welfare effect of the VER program was that the social welfare losses to the United States total around $3 billion. The Japanese manufacturers agreed to the VER program because they perceived that the likely alternative was a U.S. imposed tariff on Japanese cars which would have cost them more than $11 billion over the period of the imposition. One key long-run consequence of the VER program was that any Japanese cars produced in the U.S. were excluded from the quota limits. So Japanese automakers responded to this provision by investing heavily in U.S. production facilities. By 1990, Honda, Nissan, Toyota, Mazda, and Mitsubishi all produced substantial numbers of cars in America. The impact on U.S. consumers of the VER program is that it reduced the quantity of imports from Q1, Q4 to Q2, Q3 with a consumer surplus loss equivalent to A, B, C, D. The larger triangle of consumer surplus value under the demand curve and above the price at PW is now reduced to a smaller triangle equivalent to MN under the demand curve and above the price P prime, which is the higher price that resulted from the smaller quantity of imports. The impact on U.S. producers is equivalent to the area A, because U.S. producers would have increased their quantity of cars from Q1 to Q2, and uh, the profit or producer surplus above the supply curve would have increased from area E to area E plus A, so that the change in the producer surplus value would have increased by A. If the U.S. government had imposed a tariff equivalent to the difference in the price between the original world market price and the new price after the VER program, the U.S. government would have obtained revenues equivalent to Area C on a quantity Q2, Q3. Because the program allowed the Japanese producers to retain the benefit of the higher price, Area C did not go to the U.S. government, but effectively it went to the Japanese automakers so that GHJ was approximately equal to the area CH so that G and J would have been equivalent to the area C. We can see now the overall effects. We have the producer surplus changing by A, positive, consumer surplus changing by A, B, C, D, negative. So the net welfare effect with the VER program is minus B, C, D. Consumers loss plus producers gain. If there were a tariff program in place, the government would have gotten area C so that the consumer loss plus the producer gain plus the government gain would have left the overall society with a loss of BD, triangles BD. Triangle B is referred to as a production or supply related distortion and triangle D is referred to as a demand or consumption-related distortion.
The production-related distortion is due to the fact that we are paying a higher marginal cost to produce the product in the United States, and uh, that rising marginal cost of a product that could have been imported at a price PW implies that the increased domestic production does not increase the revenues to the U.S. producers as much as if we had just imported the quantity from zero to Q2 and sold it at a price P prime, then we would have earned the profit of AB. The additional profit from increasing the domestic supply is A, and it could have been AB. So area B is a production related distortion. Area D, the demand or consumption related distortion, is a consequence of the smaller quantity of products that were being demanded at Q3 and the higher price. So consumers lost, and uh, because there's no surplus value associated with Q3, Q4, because it no longer is consumed, area D represents the lost consumer surplus value. Consumers did switch away from the quantity Q3, Q4, so there's no value, and hence there's no surplus value to be had. So in summary, we have consumers losing ABCD, which is $13 billion, Producers gaining A, which is $10 billion. Area C, equivalent to G plus J, to keep the Japanese earnings constant. The impact on the U.S. government is, in this analysis, zero, because the government did not get to keep the revenues that would have been accruing to the government were there an imposition of a tariff. And the deadweight losses are the production-related distortion and the consumption-related distortion. And the impact on the overall U.S. economy is BCD.